Okay, so chapter 8, mass media and public opinion. So what is public opinion? Well, public opinion are the attitudes that are held by a significant number of people on matters of government and politics. So attitudes held by a significant number of people on matters of government and politics. That's public opinion. So it doesn't mean that everybody agrees with the public opinion, it just means that a large number do. And so that's kind of what people are looking at. What's the public's opinion on this? So there are different factors that shape public opinion. Uh, the first one is family. It's a child's first exposure uh, to politics is through the child's parents. And that's where you gain your basic attitudes about things on taxes or uh, you know, people's rights, that kind of stuff. That's where you gain your first, first impressions. The second factor is schools. And schools are here to teach you to be good citizens. We teach American values. We teach the political system. So we're here to teach you how to be good citizens, basically. How to be productive citizens once you're out in the real world. The third are opinion leaders. And opinion leaders are any person who has a more than usual influence on the views of others. So somebody that is very well respected, somebody that people look up to. So like ministers and doctors and lawyers, um, teachers, radio personalities, uh, there's all kinds of different things that could be included in there. But they have a more than usual influence on how people think. The fourth is mass media. And mass media includes TV and radio and films and magazines and books and all kinds of stuff, newspapers. 90% um, of American homes today have at least one TV set, which is on for an average of seven hours a day. That's a lot of FaceTime with mass media that it can influence you. It can help shape your opinion. And the fifth is just a mix of factors like your occupation can help shape your public opinion because things that concern me as a teacher may not concern someone who's in the business world or somebody who's um, doing manual labor. Uh, race is also a factor. You know, as a white person or a white woman, I'm not as concerned about things that maybe are affecting Native Americans or whatever. Um, issues are another big thing that there are certain issues that uh, cert some people are going to get more involved in that, that hit more home with them. So when we look at measuring public opinion, how the heck do they do that? Because you can't obviously ask everybody in the United States what their thoughts are. So there's a lot of challenges here. How do you get an act accurate portrayal of what that public opinion is? How can you make sure it's reliable? Well, that's a really hard thing to do. There are different ways that you can measure public opinion. Um, the first and the easiest probably is elections. Uh, you just look at election results. Did people like this or not? Um, the problem is that election results are not very reliable. Uh, voting results sometimes have nothing to do with the issues and, and all to do with the candidates or, or sometimes it has nothing to do with candidates. It's all about the issues. So it's really hard to determine what the public opinion is on it. Another way you can measure is to look at interest groups. And interest groups are private organizations where members share certain views and then they try to influence law. Um, so they can present their views and, and they can do demonstrations and rallies and all kinds of stuff like that. But how many people are really represented and how strong are their beliefs? Those are two things that are really hard to determine because some people are, are in it just because it looks good on a resume and others are gung-ho because maybe it affected a family member or themselves. And so they are very, very into it. Um, another way to measure is through media. You can look at newspapers and read editorials or see commentaries on television or on the radio uh, to kind of gauge where people are, what people are thinking. Again, the problem is that it's not very accurate. It's one person's opinion. It's not necessarily a reflection of what the entire population thinks. Another way is through personal contacts. Um, in terms of what comes into Congress. What kinds of emails are they getting? What kind of uh, phone calls? What kind of mail are they getting? But are these people who are writing to Congress, are they really the voice of the people? You know, are, are you finding out only what they want to find out? Are you not, are you not finding, you know, are these the people that are very passionate about it? So does it really reflect what other people are thinking and, and all that kind of stuff? So 
ba basically the best way to measure public opinion is through polls. And so with a poll, you are going to collect information by asking people questions. And there's different ways to poll, and not all of them are good ways to poll. Uh, the first one is a straw poll, and a straw poll just means that you're going to ask the same question to a large number of people. You want to ask as many people as possible this one question, or one or two questions. Um, straw polls are very, very common. They happen a lot, but they are kind of unreliable because it tends to emphasize quantity, like, I asked a thousand people this question, and here's the results, rather than the quality of the answers or the quality of the question itself. So it kind of has its drawbacks as well. The second type of poll is a scientific poll. And a scientific poll is going to follow the scientific process. Um, the most famous one is the Gallup poll. And they, they use this on TV and, and in newspapers and magazines all the time. They refer to the Gallup poll on whatever it is. Um, but the polling process, basically the first step is that you have to define your universe. Um, are we looking at just the state of Iowa? Are we looking at the city of Remsen? Are we looking at the entire nation? What is your universe or what is your public? And then your second step is you're going to construct a sample, which is just a, a representative slice of that. You're going to pick a little bit that's going to reflect that. And so you can randomly do it or you can say, no, I'm going to make a quota. i got to have this many... You know, there's this many men and women in Remsen, so I gotta have this many men and women in my poll. So you could do it that way, or you could just randomly do it and hope that it's close. Um, the third step is to prepare, prepare valid questions. Basically, you gotta look at questions that are not gonna lead people to an answer. Just because you wanna hear a certain answer doesn't mean that, that everybody believes the same thing you do. So you have to really work on non-leading questions. For example, if if you were asked these two questions, the first one is, should local taxes be increased? Most people are going to say no, because who wants to have more taxes? I mean, that takes more money out of your pocket, right? So most people are going to say no. But what if you said, should the police force be increased in order to fight our increased crime in our community? You know, catching bad guys. Well, most people are going to say, oh yeah, we need more police because we have increased crime in our community. I want to feel safer. But underlying that is, in order to pay for these increased tax or increased um, police force, you're going to have to increase taxes. So, you know, depending on what you want to hear that, yeah, it's okay to increase taxes as long as this is what you're using it for. Or, no, we just don't want taxes increased. How you frame that question is going to determine how most people are going to answer. So you really have to be careful of how you are presenting those questions. The fourth step is to select and control the means in which the poll is taking. So if you are going around and knocking on doors and asking the question. You have to do that for everyone. You can't say, oh, half of them I'm going to email and phone call some people, and then when I get time, I'll go around door to door. Everyone needs to be done in the same way because a question asked through email or on an online site is not going to sound the same as somebody's face-to-face. And you guys encounter this all the time. You know, how often do you text something and somebody takes it totally the wrong way? Well, that's not how I said it in my head, but that's how somebody takes it because they read it differently. They, they you know, put those words together in their head differently or they, they give you a tone in your voice that you didn't intend. So you have to make sure you control the means of, of, the, po of the polling process. And then the fifth thing is once you get everything together and you tabulate all your results, you need to report your findings to the public. So pretty simple process in, in some ways. I mean, the straw poll is way easier to do, but it's very unreliable. You don't get quite the same results. So when you are evaluating the polls, you know, most polls are fairly reliable, but it's still really difficult in a polling process to measure intensity really hard to know how intense somebody feels about something. You know, if, if it affected them personally, like if they were, um, if you were going around and asking for more cancer research, you know, should we fund more ca cancer research? People who have had people who have had family or friends pass away from cancer are going to be much more intense in their answer. Um, stability. Is that answer always going to be the same? Is it going to change the next day? You know, is it something that they are really gung-ho about and really truly believe in, or are they kind of wishy-washy? The polls can't tell us that. And then relevance. 
you know, if somebody came around and, and asked about cancer to me, you know, I, I don't have anybody that passed away from cancer. Uh, you know, other things, yeah, like Alzheimer's, yes, but not from cancer. So it's not really relevant to me. I, I really wouldn't have an opinion. So, again, you can't really, um, you can't really measure those things. Um, the difficulty with polls as well is that uh, people like to fall on the bandwagon. Uh, the bandwagon effect that you want to go with the winner. Well, who's do what? What did everybody else say? What did my neighbor say? You know, you tend to want to go with with what other people are doing. Um, and a, a kind of a side note: when you look at polls, they are not elections. <laughs> They're not a substitute for an election. In fact, multiple times are polls wrong when they say that according to the Gallup poll, the president is leading his opponent by four points or by seven points or whatever. And a lot of times it's super off. Like it, it's not a determination of who's going to win the election or, or, or what choice is going to be made. So when we look at mass media and politics and how that influences things, like I said, mass media is things like TV and newspapers. It's, it's a means of communication that can reach a large group of people. It has a large target audience. And there are different types. We have the TV. And TV actually began in 1939. Uh, FDR used it in his campaigns. Um, it will replace, or it has replaced newspapers. About 80% of the population say TV is their primary source of information. Although I'm pretty sure the internet is up and coming in that. Um, newspapers is another form of mass media. There's about 11,000 major newspapers in the U.S. today. It's our second largest source of information. The nice thing about newspapers is that they can go in greater detail, in greater depth than, than TV, and you can get various viewpoints, whereas TV you tend to get one, um, maybe two. The next one is radio, and radio was invented in 1920. Again, FDR used it in his campaigns. And radio is kind of nice because it's conveniently available. It's in your car, it's in your house, it's you know all over the place. You, you can hear it in stores and all kinds of stuff. The average person listens to about 20 hours of radio a week. Vast majority of people, however, aren't listening to news radio. They're listening to music radio, which is an entirely different venue. The fourth one is magazines, and there's a lot of magazines out there that help with um, understanding politics or getting people knowledgeable about politics, so like Harper's Weekly, um, The Atlantic Monthly, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, Time, Newsweek, U.S. News, and World Report, all of those um, focus a lot on politics as well. When we look at media's impact on politics, media has a public agenda. Um, they don't tell you what what to think about or what to think excuse me they don't tell you what to think instead they think you, they tell you what to think about they direct you as to what you should be thinking about so whatever stories they're focusing on that's what they think you should be thinking about they don't tell you what to think about them necessarily not always I shouldn't say that um, they don't always tell you what to think about them but they are very much directing where your attention should be and so by emphasizing and downplaying events and issues and their features, they are able to focus the attention of the public on particular issues. And a lot of the time, it's the bosses of these companies that are making that determination that we need to focus on this. Um, when you look at influential media, for TV, you have CBS and ABC and NBC. Those are the, the big networks. Um, newspapers, the New York Times is one that people look at a lot. The Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Those are very influential papers. Um, when you look at wire services like the Associated Press or the AP or the UPI, which is the United Press International, these are independent reporters that write reports or write stories and then send it to newspapers and they send it to magazines and all kinds of stuff. Um, your news weeklies like Time and Newsweek and the, the U.S. News and World Report, they're all very, very influential in terms of, of directing the public's attention. When we look at electoral politics, so when we get to the election politics, uh, candidates are less reliant on the parties for their advertisement anymore. They, they really don't go to their party to get advertising money. They, they fundraise themselves. And so um, they put a lot of consideration into location, uh, the lighting, you know, what's going to show them in a good light, their camera angles. And so they're focusing a lot more on the image as opposed to the substance of the message. 
Um, these campaign programs typically, these commercials, they don't they don't want them to be more than a minute or two. They want to keep it interesting. They want to keep it exciting. And so they'll use these little sound bites. And sound bites are little snappy reports that um, they air for like 30 or 45 seconds. So maybe something that they said that they can they can um, tear apart or they're they're using to to show how good their candidate is or or show how bad the other guy is. There are limits on the media's influence, so I hate to sound like they're they're like all controlling, all powerful, because they really aren't. They do have some limits. Um, not many people today follow all the events closely. You're, you're going to pick the ones that interest you the most or the ones that maybe affect you, and that's what you're going to be focusing on. People tend to be very selective about issues. You don't read or listen or watch opinions that disagree with you. People just don't like to listen to someone who disagrees with their opinion. They just don't like that. Um, most people tend to skim the news, and so that's why on TV news programs, their news stories are, are 60 to 90 seconds. They have those time slots, and that's it. They don't go in depth because they lose viewers. People don't want to stick around and watch an hour on one topic. And finally, people today are just more interested in being entertained than they are in being informed. And so that's a huge limit on media. They got to entertain you. And if they're entertaining you with a cat stuck up a tree rather than the local politician spouting off about something, that's what they're going to do because it's entertaining as opposed to being informational. So that's how media can be um, limited in its influence. It's not all powerful.